Buzzer, good afternoon. Good afternoon. It's always a fantastic thing to start our genealogy <laughs> year off, our researching year, with an interesting topic to really put our minds in a place where, you know, we hadn't thought about before. And this is true for myself in today's talk. Um, I've been looking everywhere for some ancestors. And I haven't found them yet, but I continue to search. And, and we're right when David comes with a new document to the library or we order some new films, which we have done recently, um, you know, I'm, I'm anxious to see what's in there. Mr. Rabin, Mr. Robert Rabin, or Roberto Rabin, um, brings new information today, and he brought lots of information. He was born in Boston, Massachusetts, and when he speaks, he doesn't speak with a Boston accent, he speaks with a Spanish accent. And that's because at one point or the other in 1980, he arrived on the island of Vieques to do some research and decided to stay. 30 years later, <laughs> he is continuing to add to this community, to the community of Vieques. He is the founder and director of the Vieques Historic Archives, as well as the director of the Vieques Museum of Art and History. He brings with him a wealth of knowledge, not only of past Vieques, but current history of Vieques as well, which I think is critical to our understanding of their progression and their movement forward. And so I'm going to leave, everybody has his bio, I'm going to introduce Mr. Roberto Rabin. Thank you and welcome. Thank you, Nadine. Let me get my notes. Good afternoon, and uh, thank you all for being here. Thank you for this invitation um, to share with you a little bit of Yekis history, uh, some of Yekis historic relations with the rest of the Caribbean, um, including St. Thomas and St. Croix, in particular St. Croix. Uh, I want to thank Nadine in particular for being such a gracious host and a very enthusiastic tour guide this morning. I, I'm sure I had a privileged opportunity to get to know an important part of the historic center and the historic architecture of um, St. Thomas, at least this area of St. Thomas. And uh, in fact, she spent a, a couple of hours with me this morning, taking me and allowing me to get out every four or five minutes to take pictures. <laughs> so I'm grateful. And uh, I also like to uh, uh, congratulate all of you for this such important effort and well-organized process uh, to help document for future generations uh, the history of uh, St. Thomas. So, uh, let me say that I um, would like to share with you today uh, several elements of Vieques history. Uh, we want to focus obviously on these historic relationships between Vieques and the rest of the Antilles and other areas in the Caribbean. Um, I want to share with you also some of the bibliographic uh, resources, some of the materials we have available at our historic archives in Vieques, in, located in this building, which is the Fort Count Mirasol Museum now. This is a historic monument, uh, and I direct this museum for the Institute of Puerto Rican Culture. And uh, in the museum, in the building, we have the historic archives. And, uh, we are leaving here today for the library a DVD that includes, is it a DVD or a CD? One of those round things. Huh? <laughs> and it has a lot of PDF uh, documents. And it's about 30,000 pages. And it's the first process. It's our first phase in the digitizing project to try to digitize some of the maybe a million pages we might have in the archives and so on the document you will find a wide variety of materials related to archaeology and architecture and literature and uh, um, slavery in the 19th century sugar plantations the French Danish British influences again via case migration processes between 
Vieques and other islands. Um, and there are also a few thousand pages from the uh, local Catholic Church death records and baptism records from the from 1840 to 1873, which are specifically the dates of the official founding of the town of Vieques as a Spanish colony, part of Puerto Rico, 1844, and the abolition of slavery in Puerto Rico, uh, 22 March of 1873. So several thousand pages of these documents on birth and uh, baptism and death records focus on uh, enslaved Africans in Vieques many of whom came uh, from Guadalupe and Martinica. They didn't come, but they were brought, obviously, from Guadalupe and Martinica uh, by a large number of uh, planters, French planters who moved into Vieques, and we'll talk about this a little more, that process. This is in the second half of the 19th century. The document, the, this, uh, the other materials digitized include some of Vieques newspapers, uh, several newspapers, including the Vieques Times, which ran for 18 years consecutively, a bilingual newspaper, began in the 80s and ended in um, uh, 2004, I believe. And so I'd like to um, livigate uh, this um, presentation to Charlie Conley, who just recently died, who together with Mirna Pagan and the family, the family put together the Vieques Times and ran it for so long. And uh, so we'll think about him uh, during this process. Uh, I'd like to talk about this historic relationship of Vieques. Uh, let me see if I can make this machine run. Now I know I was taught to point there. I'll go back, I wanna go backwards, so backwards. Maybe that's backwards. That's backwards, that's backwards. That looks good, all right. So, all right, so I think we already said this, and now we'll say, uh, speaking with Nadine this morning and then listening also to some people uh, speak as they began to came into this room today, uh, I quickly took down some notes and noticed that, I mean, Nadine obviously demonstrates, manifests uh, something that I've been hearing uh, from other people as you converse, this passion for history and historic investigation and uh, to understand, to help understand this relationship between collective identity, uh, collective memory, history, including genealogy, obviously, and identity is so key, at least I, I believe for people in Vieques, and I'm sure applying also here to St. Thomas and other places. And history as a tool, uh, and, and I want to sound pamphleteering, but to resist these dynamics of gentrification. and. This is something we talked a little bit about this morning, but it's been a topic of interest for us in Vieques, these processes of um, population displacement that take place everywhere. We had a great movie last week about uh, gentrification in the, uh, East Harlem, in El Barrio Latino, where uh, people now cannot live in their own neighborhoods that they've lived in for generations because others want to come in with greater economic power and are creating a different space and displacing a community. And we believe that it is history and people's knowledge of history that will help to create a stronger community, to be able to build a sustainable, genuine sustainable community with space for everybody. People who want to come in from other places, but at least to help people to be able to stay in their own place and fight and resist those forces that might uh, push them out. So, backwards, forwards. Uh, someone needs to tell me when I should stop. So yeah, I know we want to talk for about 20 minutes, half an hour is the idea. So someone could say when half an hour is up or when there's five more minutes, and then I'll probably talk for 20 minutes more. <laughs> <laughs> so many times we describe Vieques history with the number 4,000, or 4,000 years of history of Vieques history. And, to, and, and we're focusing on migration. Migration obviously is a, an important element in the genealogical processes and studies. And Vieques migrations that we know about begin in four, about 4,000 years ago. This is the Puerto Ferro Man archaeological site in Vieques. In 1990, the archaeologists from the Center for Archaeological Investigation at the University of Puerto Rico's main campus discovered the skeletal remains of a man who lived there about 4,000 years ago, according to the carbon dating done on the... Um, material uh, discovered. Um, so we know people moved in to Vieques from some other place around then. Um, 
other work by the same team from the University of Puerto Rico in the mid 70s and late 70s found material remains including ceramics tools and a treasure of jewelry uh, on the south coast of Vieques in an area known as La Hueca and the, um, the, by investigating and researching and working on this material uh, defined and named a, a hitherto unknown cultural complex uh, now known and in, in archaeological and anthropological texts as Huecoide in honor of La Hueca which is the place um, a migration of people into that era, these people living on the south coast of Vieques about 2,000 years ago, people who were producing a great amount of not only ceramics of different types, but also a, again, a treasure of uh, jewelry um, uh, produced in semi-precious stones not found in Vieques or Puerto Rico, uh, like jadeite, amethyst, and with figures and symbols images of elements from other places as well like the Andean condor this is this was made in Vieques about 2000 years ago there were several others some in process of fabrication some just the raw material so we know they were being made there in Vieques and this has been identified by bird experts as the condor of the Andes so we know it came from either Bolivia or Peru or Ecuador by the indigenous peoples moving into the area from the north coast of Venezuela, uh, maybe coming out of the Andes. So, very interesting migration process that connects us and connects, we can say, the genealogies of the first peoples of Vieques to the Andes. Um, this way. Uh, in the um, period of the European uh, process of coming into the Caribbean, or sometimes known as um, discovery and conquest and colonization, which was a process of burning, raping, pillaging, stealing. Uh, um, in Vieques was, no, was, was also part of that process. Uh, the Danish, British, and Spanish interests saw cr what the Danish called Craban Island and the British Crab Island and the Spanish known uh, called Vieques. And they all had interests. So in the early period of this process of colonization, the, the 17th, 18th century, and even to the 19th century, a lot of diplomatic <coughs> communique between Copenhagen, Londres, London, and Madrid about who <coughs> owns this property. The Danish sent several um, uh, reconnaissance missions from the Virgin Islands into the area of Vieques and Puerto Rico in the 18th century and did several maps and other documents that extolling the virtues of Vieques' great. Uh, um, forest, woods, land, uh, earth, soil, uh, water, etc. These are documents that we found at the Wim Great House many years ago uh, and are now part of our library and uh, our museum in Vieques. And uh, in the 19th century, the Spanish get serious about Vieques, lest the British or Danish come and take it. So they uh, begin to formally organize a colony in the early part of the 19th century. And um, the building of the fort is part of that. Uh, the building of the fort is part of that. The fort was built in the 1840s. <coughs> it is on the U.S. Federal Register of Historic Places, a uh, military uh, outpost, a military fort, although never involved in military action per se, never attacked. The cannons on the walls were never fired at anyone. It was used, however, extensively as a prison. Um, it was used uh, to as part of a brutal repressive judicial system designed to control the working population and defend the interests of uh, wealthy white slave owners, sugar, uh, haciendas, etc. And also to keep an eye on the independence movement of Puerto Rico fighting for freedom and independence against Spain. Uh, let me go back a bit to 1816 and mention <coughs> another contact. Again, Vieques has these migration uh, contacts and so I'll say genealogical relationships with the Andes we now know with people 4,000 years ago and their precedence is not 100% sure but the Andes and obviously the Taino indigenous people let me also let me go back a little further but, uh, when the Spanish did come in and participate in this burning raping pillaging stealing process known sometimes as conquest and colonization 
uh, the Taino indigenous people, the Arawak peoples, who were brothers and sisters and cousins to those here in the Virgin Islands and in the rest of the Puerto Rican archipelago and in Jamaica and in Cuba and in the La Española, um, the Dominican Republic and Haiti. Uh, these indigenous peoples fought to the death to defend their cultures, their people, their land, their place. And in Vieques, we know from the chronicler's reports, um, the, uh, the Spanish officials who took copious notes of what was happening at the period. In 1514, two Taino chiefs, Casimar and Yaurebo, defended, together with hundreds of other Tainos, men and women, who went in canoes, 50 to 60 people in a canoe, from Vieques to the main island of Puerto Rico to attack Spanish military positions. That same year, Spanish military expeditions went to Vieques and decimated the Taino populations. I just want to mention this process of resistance, again, um, that has been part of Vieques' collective history and collective mentality, beginning uh, with the indigenous peoples and their defense of culture against the Spanish imposition. But again, to go back, the Spanish, after destroying the... Taino population in the uh, 16th century don't do anything with Vieques for a few centuries. So Vieques is kind of no man's land or no woman's land for a few centuries until the beginning of the 19th century when they begin to organize a formal colony. In the interim, in the 17th, 18th centuries, people from some areas close by on the main island of Puerto Rico as well as others who came over from, we believe, St. Thomas, St. Croix, St. Kitts, Neves, Virgin Gorda, uh, came into Vieques uh, and settled at, in temporary fishing camps or to cut uh, wood for fuel or construction. And eventually some stayed and became part of the original population when the Spanish began to formally organize at the beginning of the 19th century. We know there was some pirate activity in 17, uh, 1699. William Kidd, William Sims, British pirates were um, uh, tried in the Boston courts. Um, for uh, selling stolen merchandise on the shores of Crab Island, Vieques. Anyway, in the 19th century, again, the Spanish began to formally colonize. 1811, the Spanish government in Puerto Rico sends the first military commandant. But it's in, uh, 19, in 1860, briefly in August of that year, according to documents at the National Historic Archives of Puerto Rico in San Juan, Simon Bolivar, the great liberator of the Americas, Venezuelan, uh, comes to Vieques for a brief period while he is in the Caribbean. Uh, we believe uh, probably just before that, maybe in, I, in, in Haiti, in Haiti uh, where he had the support of the revolutionary government of Haiti um, for the independence movement of the Americas. He was in uh, Vieques, we believe, for a few days in August, according to the documents, in recognition of the fact that Vieques is the only place in all of Puerto Rico touched by Simon Bolivar, the Venezuelan government, his own country, gave the people of Vieques a statue of Bolivar that's in the public square. And every year on the 24th of July, Bolivar's birthday, we have an activity to remember that historic distinction of Vieques. Um, so connections now again with Venezuela, uh, important connections. Also in the 1860s, this building was uh, a, a, a prison, and, during, and I'll say this in honor of Christian, I don't know if Christian is still around or not, Christian, as I believe his family is from the Dominican Republic. Am I right about that? So in this building, in the 1860s, the, the Dominican Republic won its independence from Spain in 1844. But in the 1860s, there were those in the power structure of the Dominican Republic who wanted to bring the Dominican Republic back into the Spanish Empire and make it a part of Spain again for their own personal gain. Uh, but others, most in the Dominican Republic, wanted to maintain and restore their independence. So there was a war known as the War for Restoration. Uh, and uh, the Spanish military forces from San Juan and from, from Havana, Cuba, went to the Dominican Republic to, again, try to retake control of the Dominican Republic. And in the process, brought to this Spanish military fort on Vieques, uh, in 1862, 25 Dominican prisoners of war, freedom fighters, from ages 12 to about 80. And we have their names and information again from the Catholic Church death records. All registered, at 25 of them, and all registered as um, uh, Dominican prisoners of war. And the interesting specific details that we've shared with Dominican scholars and, and other uh, uh, investigators in the Dominican Republic. These people, these 25 Dominican prisoners of war, again, freedom fighters, 
were forced to work on the roads of Vieques in the early 60s, and then between uh, December 1864 and March of 1865, they all died. We don't know how, we can speculate, but they are all registered. One died in, in the December of 64, 1864, and then a few days later, others died and through the, the week, and then during that period, from December to March, the 25 died. So every year on 16 August, which is Dominican Restoration Day, we have an activity in Vieques at the museum and the old cemetery to remember these Dominican freedom fighters who gave their lives for the freedom and independence of their country at the fort in Vieques. People from the event, the Dominican consulate come, and others from the small Dominican community in, in Vieques, and from the Dominican Republic uh, community in Puerto Rico. So Vieques has these interesting contacts and nexus and relationships with other parts of the Caribbean through its historic processes. Um, but let's let's focus a little more, if we can, now on this area. And let's see if I go the right direction. Uh, that go this direction. Some other documents. These are some of the French French maps as well. I have a big collection of maps uh, um, that show Vieques in its Caribbean context at our museum. Danish, French, British, uh, U.S., and other maps. This is a a Danish, I mean a French uh, map from the 18th century. This is one of many documents, this one from Guadalupe, uh, a health bill for people moving into the into Vieques from Guadalupe uh, in 1871. Um, as I mentioned, a large number of French planters came into Vieques with permission from the Spanish government in Puerto Rico to help develop this sugar industry. And because Africa, uh, African slavery was to be abolished in Guadalupe and Martinica in the 1840s. In Vieques, in Puerto Rico, it continued until 1873. So these uh, slave owners read in the writing on the walls that let's take our you know, slaves out of here, bring them over to Vieques, and we can keep you know, uh, squeezing them and you know, milking them for all we can, at least until slavery ends there. So they did and became a powerful force in Vieques, economic and political um, processes. This is, these are some of the French families, uh, Lompre, Avoy, and we have a long list of French names, Cherot, Brumoville, Mouray, uh, um, Martineau, Le Brum. From Dominica, uh, Charles Eldridge moves into Vieques in 1874. And these are, these again, are some of the documents we have uh, uh, one uh, section of about, uh, I'm not sure if there are 85 or 87 passports or uh, documents of people moving specifically from St. Thomas and St. Croix into Vieques in the 1860s and 70s, like this one. Moving from St. Croix, John Brown moves into Vieques in October of 1872. And from the documentation, census documents at the beginning of the 20th century, we know that many of these people came into Vieques as workers. This was a large number of free black English-speaking Protestant men and women who make up an important element of Vieques working population in the 19th century. And so simultaneously with African slaves, other peons or workers from Puerto Rico, we have this interesting multicultural um, community of workers in Vieques. James Griffith, also in 1872, comes into Vieques from St. Croix. Uh, and we have, a, again, a, a series of these in this case, Mr. Evan and Son come in, and in this document they describe Vieques as Crab Island. Uh, another name, again, the Danish and British used Crab or Crab and Island. This one in 1873. These are some documents. I know they're, it's difficult to see. Um, I, I won't, uh, I was going to go over there and make this, uh, you know, zoom it, zoom it in, but let me just mention to you that on the, this is some information we gleaned from the 1910. Uh, U.S. federal census on Vieques. And as you all know, in the census it will tell you where the person was born and then where the father was born or the mother. Uh, this is the, the name of the person. So we have John Adams, we have Mary Andres, uh, Anduzi, Amelia Anthony, we have Baldwins, Barker, Barry, Bastion, we have Blondine, Book, Charles, Christian, Class, Craner, Daniel, Davis, uh, Gatliff, Henderson, Henry, Hodge, Hoggins, Etc. Etc. All these English surnames uh, coming in, and mainly these are people who were either born in Saint Croix or their parents, Saint Croix and Saint Thomas, uh, and some in other areas as well. These are the specifically Saint Croix and Saint Thomas. We have other documents where we have 
uh, pulled out those from Tortola, Virgin Gorda, and, and other St. Croix, St. Kitts, Nevis. Uh, but as you can see, a large number of these people, and they are basically workers. There's a, a, a cook, a, a, a ironer, or a person who irons clothes. This is a person, a guaratero. Um, this is a, a metal worker, metal worker at one of the sugar mills, probably. A worker, uh, this is a, um, a person on a boat, a boat person, a cleaner, washer, uh, albanil, you know, plaster on walls, uh, so a carpenter, among others. Uh, so a large number of free black men and women make up a working population that are, we describe in Vieques historiography as tortoleños. Obviously not all from Tortola. But for some reason, uh, people who began to write about this issue uh, in uh, the 1950s and 60s used that description of tortoleños for all this uh, large group of people. This is just the second page, and again, the, the last names. We have Peterson and McFawson and McFarlane and Richards and uh, Samuels and uh, Taylor and Walker and Williams. And these are all names, many of them still in Vieques. There are Family names in Vieques like Adams, Brown, Huggins, Williams are very much Vieques, Puerto Rican names to this day, but they come from this migration of people from St. Thomas and St. Croix into Vieques in this last part, in the second half of the 19th century. Um, so I want to speak a little bit about the push-pull factor, these forces that move people, that that cause migration, that make people move. Some people move because they want to, but I think historically most people don't. Most people move because they need to, whether it's for education or economic necessity, uh, sometimes because a, a more powerful group comes in and pushes them out, whether it's militarily or economically or politically. Uh, in any case, in, in the 19th century, as we just saw, certain historic factors and political factors, the abolition of slavery and the uh, British and Danish islands in the 1840s uh, had uh, meant that we had a large number of free black men and women who could move out of the Virgin Islands and out of this area and moved into Vieques to plug into a sugar industry in, in crescendo that was growing. Um, at the same time, um, later on, the uh, migration process, the direction changes. In the uh, Puerto Rico is invaded by the United States in 1898, the Spanish-American-Cuban-Filipino War of 1898. The Puerto Rico, um, U.S. citizenship is imposed upon Puerto Rico, and this also includes Vieques. Um, in this process, uh, l let me mention that at the beginning of that period, in the last decade of the 19th century and first decades of the 20th century in Vieques, we have four large sugar central factories milling thousands of tons of sugar cane a year. I want to again talk about the uh, economic context as uh, pressures for pushing or pulling people in, in, into or out of Vietnam. Yeah. So we have this large sugar industry that again attracts workers from the islands that I mentioned and, and not just St. Thomas, St. Croix, St. Kitts, Nevis, Tortola, Vision Gorda as well and, and others, Anguilla, uh, come into Vieques in the 19th century and even the first years of the 20th. Uh, by the end of the 1930s, only one of the sugar mills is still operating in Vieques for a series of reasons we won't get into now. But the Great Depression uh, of, of the 1930s was a, a serious issue. There were labor strikes, big uh, strike in 1915 in Vieques as well throughout all of Puerto Rico. Uh, but by the end of the 30s, there is a crisis in Vieques. And people begin to leave. Uh, let me see if I'm... Right on this, there's some of this, the ruins of this Playa Grande, the largest sugar mill, some of the most important ruins of the 19th and early 20th century sugar industry in Puerto Rico. Uh, let me say that with this movement now, uh, because the sugar mills are died down, because St. Croix is now part of the United States territory, and in 1927, uh, when U.S. citizenship is also uh, imposed, I will say, in the Virgin Islands. This now means, and, and at the same time, I believe there was legislation that L outlawed or made it illegal or more di much more difficult uh, to bring in workers who were not U.S. citizens to work in St. Thomas and St. Croix and St. John. 
so um, the people who had the sugar plantations in St. Croix, for instance, looked to Vieques as this source of American citizen workers who were also looking to find work because of the decline in the sugar industry in Vieques. So they went and began to get people. Martina Bellardo, is, we interviewed her in the 1990s. I had a uh, late 80s with when I was teaching in the high school in Vieques during the 1980s and had a history club and we went to St. Croix on several occasions to interview Viequenses who had gone to St. Croix in the 1930s, 40s, 50s, etc. to know more about Vieques history. Because to know the history of Vieques you must know the history of St. Croix and I would say vice versa as well. So, but Martina Velardo was one of the people who went to uh, St. Croix in the 1920s, the late 20s, as part of that process. Uh, and these are, these are just some of the people we interviewed. You'll see, you'll see some more of those photos. So we have a serious crisis in Vieques at the end of the 30s, as I mentioned, that begins to push people out. Uh, this is from the El Mundo newspaper, one of the most important newspapers in Puerto Rico at the time, no longer exists. 1939, uh, and the headline says, the island of Vieques is uh, emptying. And uh, a fam Viequense families moved by the hundreds to St. Croix, escaping the horrific situation of misery that is, uh, that is the reality of Viequense. And, and they move into St. Croix. So we get this large number of people moving into St. Croix from the end of the 1920s and throughout the 1930s. So again, we have this change of direction. In the 19th century, people moving from these islands into Vieques to work in the sugar industry. By the 1930s, the direction is now from Vieques uh, into these islands. Uh, let's go. And another important element in the migration process of Viequenses into other places. And we also want to mention Culebra. Because just as Viequenses moved from Vieques to St. Croix, Culebrenses, people from Culebra, moved from Culebra to St. Thomas as the economic crisis grew more and more in Culebra as a result of, again, different economic factors, but also in the uh, the U.S. Navy took control of most lands on Vieques and Culebra, and Culebra from the beginning of the 20th century, but in Vieques between 1940 and 1950, the U.S. Navy took control of two-thirds of Vieques, about 72% of Vieques, about 26,000 of Vieques, 33,000 acres, to bomb the eastern end and use it as a gunnery range and maneuver area, and the western end to use as an ammunition storage facility. Moving all the people out, closing down the last sugar um, mill, uh, putting an end to an already dying sugar industry, but putting an end to that, taking away the most, the most important, closest uh, maritime communication route between Vieques and the main island, forcing the people to use an 18 mile 18 nautical mile route between Vieques and Puerto Rico instead of the natural and shortest route that's only six to eight miles from the western part of Vieques to Puerto Rico. So a great crisis. The economy again basically stopped um, uh, because of U Navy takeover of the lands and closing of the sugar facilities. Um, so all of these factors move people out. And, and one of the places people in Vieques go to is to St. Croix, and I'm, I'm sure many of you know about this important uh, historic relationship. We don't need to go into too much detail, but here are just some of, just a graphic about the, the population change when the Navy came in. This is Vieques before the Navy expropriations where people lived, as you can see, they lived throughout the entire island after the Navy came in everybody has moved into the middle of the island. So this exacerbated the economic crisis, uh, put a strong pressure on people to leave, and they did, for a population of somewhere around 12,000 people in the 1940s, went down to about 6,000 in the 1960s. Now back up to about 10,000. So again, some of the people who moved into St. Croix from Vieques, we, in, we have interviewed over the years in different oral history projects and I, I know I sent over, I believe, a document called Historic Relations between Vieques and Puerto Rico that uh, partly results from some of these interviews we did uh, together with uh, uh, Diego Conde, a Viequense photographer who's been living in St. Croix for decades. Basilio Felix, who just recently died in St. Croix, a community leader among the Puerto Rican and Crucian population. Antonio <clears throat> Natividad Romero. Benigno Rodriguez, all of these people again are Viequenses 
moved into St. Croix uh, in the 1920s, 30s, and, and 40s. Question? Uh-huh. Um, they all seem to have Spanish names, but you mentioned so many French in Vieques. Did the French people stay in Vieques? No, good question. Um, some of the French people, most of the French owners of the sugar plantations left. And the French names that continue in Vieques, and are still some, are generally uh, names that were given, they're generally descendants of slaves of the French planters who were given the last names, the surnames of the French planters. But many of the French families left. They went to Haiti? It's a good question where they went to. I think some went to New York, some went back to Guadalupe and Martinica, because they were French families, but principally from Marigalan, Guadalupe, more than any other part of Guadalupe. And in terms of their nationality, were Those who stayed, if there were some who stayed, for instance, Charles Lebrun, he was a Frenchman and continued to be a French, he was actually a di French diplomat, and he controlled the Santa Maria sugar mill that had its last milling in 1920, I want to say 1922. So he was in for the first couple of decades, I'm not sure, this is, these are really important questions I've, I've not asked or looked into. What happened in relationship with you know with their nationalities? I mean these uh, these were French nationals, and whether they I don't I don't think someone like Charles Le Brun became an American citizen. I think they eventually left. <coughs> the Le Brun family left. Uh, the Murray family, Martineau family. Again, these are fellow Cherot. They are all gone. But there are some again some of the names of like the Leguiu family, the first military and political governor of the Spanish colony of Vieques between 1832 and 1843, named by the Spanish government of Puerto Rico, was a Frenchman, Théophile Jacques Joseph Marie Leguillou, from France, from, from the Campania, the big name. And he was a Frenchman who came into Haiti in the 1830s and had to split uh, with the Haitian Revolution, uh, moving into Vieques, ingratiated himself uh, with the local uh, officialdom, and finally got himself to be named governor, and was the most powerful person in Vieques history, economically and politically, uh, ever. His sons and others left. My sense is that they all went back to Paris. They went back to France, mm -hmm. his descendants. In Vieques and in the Virgin Islands, the Leguiu name continues, and they are generally descendants of slaves. Um, uh, the Legiu, Teofil Legiu, had over 100 slaves at the moment of his death, according to his inventory. But there's an interesting question of what happened in, in, in terms of nationality and citizenship. <coughs> what was that relationship between some of these French planters in the beginning of the 20th century when the U.S. takes over? Uh, so, look into that. Uh, in any event, so we uh, did this process of oral histories in the 19. 80s and early 90s with students from the Vieques High School and, and continue to do some of these projects as well of, of oral history uh, to try to get a better sense of this of these movement, of these processes of, of people moving between St. Thomas, uh, be, between Vieques and St. Croix and also now Culebra and St. Thomas. Um, so these are some of the photos of uh, students from the Vieques High School at the Wim Gray House uh, in St. Croix. Uh-huh. Uh, the people who moved from Calabria to St. Thomas, they, there was, that, that, that did not involve sugar, did it? Uh, Culebra did not have a sugar industry. Culebra was cattle industry. Okay. Uh, the, the Culebra cattle industry, like the Culebra economy in general, was intensely affected by the military presence, by military bombing, by military okay. activity and also just by the fluctuations of the U.S. economy. So in the 30s, the Great Depression was a period of much movement. And again, people from St. Dom, from Culebra, generally moved into St. Thomas, while those from Vieques went to St. Croix. Certainly there were some Culebrenses who went to St. Croix and some Viequenses who went to St. Thomas. Yeah, yeah. Or to okay. many went to other places as well. But uh, I don't know how much has been done, how much work has been done on the Culebra St. Thomas um, migration process is something that needs to be done uh, and, uh, and should be done. 
and there, there may be people doing important work that I just don't know about. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So I think I'm um, uh, just running down against some of these um, photos from the our Vieques History Club at the high school uh, in 1988 when we were all younger. This is near that my wife was younger then. Uh, Gadi Rodriguez, I think, he was the director of one of the schools in St. Croix. This is <laughs> the young, the young Rabin, and uh, there are kids also interviewing other kids from Vieques families to get a sense of the cultural elements of that reality of Viequense descendants living in St. Croix. Sundial, a guy from Vieques who had a shoe store, but a big store with a lot of different things in it, everything in it. Still there. Yeah. <laughs> and then Doña Natasia lived a long time in St. Croix. Negrito Rosado, who worked a lot of the ships as a, as a uh, marino, a sailor, on some of the you know, sailboats that moved constantly between Vieques, St. Thomas, St. Croix. <coughs> kids from Vieques families in St. Croix, and again, the Vieques History Club uh, on its way to St. Croix. So I have a feeling that's the end. <coughs> I think that's the end. So we'll just leave these kids up here. And let me just suggest again that in this DVD that we will, that we're leaving here for the library, we have some here, I think we have some here, that if anybody wants one, they are available for a donation of, uh, Usually a hundred and ninety dollars, but today twenty five. <laughs> <laughs> All right, it's always twenty five. But we, we do. I think there are three or four. The people are interested. You're welcome to you know take one for that donation. But um, there is a lot of information material. But we also have many other things in the many other documents that may be of use uh, for people who are looking into um, genealogical uh, investigating about Saint Thomas and Vieques or Saint Thomas and Culebra. Uh, we are not a Culebra archives, but we do have some things related to Culebra. And people who are interested are more than welcome to email us, and we will try to be as helpful as possible by to send you some of this material. Uh, and this uh, DVD was prepared with help from the Puerto Rican Foundation for the Humanities, which is the NEH <coughs> branch in, the, in Puerto Rico. And uh, it was done as part of a project, a concept they were developing that we call uh, Museo de la Memoria Histórica de Vieques, which would be Vieques, uh, Museum of Vieques Historic Memory. And so if you look for uh, Museo de la Memoria Histórica de Vieques online, we do have a page up, we're still working on it, but a very good chunk, a big amount of these 30,000 pages are available online. You just need to look for them. And again, maybe with the word museo, which is museum, or historia, histori history of Vieques, in Spanish, historia de Vieques, you may find our page that we are developing still. And, and I believe uh, they should be still accessible. Um, it's not everything, but a lot of the stuff is there. So I'm sure that's more than enough. <laughs> There were Danish, um, uh, there are some diplomatic communique, and I th I, I, there's a, a, a book called Así Empezó Vieques, the Vieques began this way, and it's Dr. Um, Rivera Martinez, let me think of his first name, Ma Rivera Martinez. He was one of the founders of the, the, the Humanities Department at the Center for Historic Investigation at the University of Puerto Rico's main campus in Rio Piedras. And he uh, worked as part of a team that went to Madrid and Sevilla in the 19, late 50s or <coughs> 60s and brought back an enormous amount of microfiche that were then um, transcribed. And there's a, somewhere about 905 pages of these transcribed Vieques-related 19th century documents from that mission. And it's in this documentation that Dr. Rivera Martinez used the Vieques elements of, of that, you know, those 900 pages that related to Vieques in different ways. 
uh, to write this book. And, uh, the, and we have the 905 pages, the rest of the documentation, at the archives as well as the book. And um, there are several of these diplomatic communiques where the Danish government is questioning Spain's rights over Vieques, suggesting that Vieques is part of the Danish Virgin Islands. And the British do something similar. The British made more of an attempt, and there were British subjects, for instance, in 16, uh, 1688, and then again in 1717, British subjects from Anguilla, uh, I believe, Anguilla, um, came to Vieques and set up shop and were there for many months and, 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 and appointed a governor, uh, Abraham, Abraham, I want to say Wells, Abraham, Abraham. Uh, uh, Wells or Williams, but he, you know, was appointed, and, and uh, the Spanish, when they got wind that, you know, that this Vieques had these British subjects living in Vieques, the Spanish sent a military expedition, and there was a skirmish. There were, uh, no one was killed, uh, but uh, many, many, the British subjects were taken prisoner and brought back to San Juan, and I believe there were 70 or 80 slaves who were brought back to San Juan and resold in San Juan into slavery again, but now in Puerto Rico. Um, and uh, so there was more, this was a, a more, you know, concrete attempt by British subjects to take Vieques. After that, the Spanish got more serious about, so, uh, you know, about the keeping an eye on Vieques and did a sort of Coast Guard uh, project around Vieques, uh, intermittently sending ships to make, to keep an eye on the place. And then a little bit later began to organize a formal colony. I don't have any information about Danish attempts to really settle Vieques, but we do have, again, these documents, maps, uh, so we know there were reconnaissance missions in Vieques, uh, uh, take, taking a look at it and, and seeing what, what uh, you know, whether it was worth fighting for maybe or not. Uh, but there, was, uh, there were some Danish planters as well who moved into Vieques, and other people, the um, Matthias Jarmal, who I think might be Swedish, but came in from St. Croix, was a powerful planter who started the Playa Grande Sugar Hacienda before it became a central factory in the, it was in the 1840s and 50s. Uh, and there were several other um, uh, uh, Danish and German, the Rikihoff family, who are, it's a German name, but we believe they also came in from St. Thomas and St. Croix uh, in, the la in the second half of the 19th century became very powerful figures in, in Vieques and then in, in Puerto Rico's history. Herman Riquijof uh, Sampaio was the president of the Puerto Rican Olympic Committee. His father, Herman Riquijof Morales, was a, a representative of the Puerto Rican government. Uh, and the grandfather, Adolfo Riquijof, who moved into Vieques in the second half of the 19th century, I believe from St. Thomas, um, uh, was the aduanero, the uh, customs agent, and acted as a diplomatic representative before the Spanish government of Puerto Rico for the Danish and the British at the same time, I believe. So the Danish had sort of consuls, consulate, or at least consular representatives in Vieques at different moments uh, in, the la in the latter part of the 19th century and even the first years of the 20th. Um, can you tell me a little bit about your funding and support vis-a-vis -vis the Puerto Rican government? Yeah, the, um, the museum is a project of the Institute of Puerto Rican Culture, which yes. is a Puerto Rican governmental agency. They pay my salary okay. to direct the museum, but not really to do the archival work. This is something I've kind of done uh, on the side, so don't let them know I'm doing this, so then I might like get fired. But it's been going on now for 30 years, and they have, they've been, because it actually is an important part of the museum, and that's how we work on it. But it's, um, we've got funding, some funding from the Puerto Rican Foundation for the Humanities, and a couple of smaller foundations, but the physical plant where the archives is, and the museum is all funded by the Institute of Puerto Rican Culture. So the building, again, it houses a museum. It's a two-story, a two-floor building. So you have administrative offices downstairs, the archives in a space downstairs, a relatively large space that we're trying to habilitate with air conditioning and humidity control. And we have a couple of air-conditioned spaces, the office, administrative office, and the contiguous office where we now have the Radio Vieques project that I'll tell you all about in just a, a bit. But it's basically the Institute of Puerto Rican Culture and then donations from some foundations 
Uh, and we've gotten a lot of material. Um, you know, people continuously come. We've had dozens of people have written a thesis of different, you know, th doctoral theses, master's theses from many different universities in, in Puerto Rico and elsewhere, as well as dozens of documentaries now made about Vieques. And in the last 20 years, the big, a big focus has been around the military presence and the uh, uh, very big struggle for peace and justice of Vieques as well, that I haven't spoken about only because I haven't spoken about much, but it's been sort of also one of the big focuses of my life in Vieques over the past, you know, these 33 years. Um, so a lot of people have come to Vieques interested in that topic, but also other, you know, the archaeology and history. But um, the archives sometimes, you know, we get help from some of those people who come and then make donations, either monetary donations or material that they have found as well in their research. Um, we've got a lot of family documentation, photographs and documents from families as well. Uh, the captains, uh, there was a family, for instance, that was living in Vieques in 1940, uh, 1942 from Baltimore. Uh, uh, the Joseph Catanzaro worked for the Arundel Construction Company out of Baltimore, and they were building part of the U.S. Navy facilities in Vieques and lived in Vieques the entire year of 1942. So Joseph, the father, brought his wife Blanche and his two high school age sons, Joseph Jr. and Gus. And, and they took a lot of pictures with their brownie cameras. They weren't photographers, just a family, were nice people. And um, uh, in 1992, the last remaining family member, Gus, who was now at, you know, like 85 or so, came to Vieques. He was invited by the graduate of Vieques High School graduating class of 1942, because during that year, he had become friendly with many of the younger kids there, and his, his mother as well. And, and so he came to Vieques and brought with him a, a, a video, a VHS, uh, that he made with the negatives of hundreds of these pictures that his family took. And he gave one to the mayor, and the mayor at the time called me up, Manuela Santiago, que pa' de cancer. And she called me up and you know, said, hey, Bob, you got something you probably want to see. And she gave me the video, and it had his name and number. I called him up. He sent us eventually, remember we told him about our investigation project, he sent us a shoebox with, um, I think it was 640 original negatives. The, the, you know, taken the, you know, these are negatives in, in their cellophane envelopes uh, of different sizes, uh, taken with these brownie cameras. And, you know, when it arrived, we were kind of, wow, this, you know, a treasure, right? And we got funding. This is another NEA, this is with NEA, National Endowment for the Arts, funding out of ten or fifteen thousand dollars to develop and then to create an exhibit with these and so we call it the Catanzaro collection. It's so the incredible photographs of that period, architecture, a lot of photos of young women, because you get these two nineteen year old kids. <laughs> so you get all these young women in Vieques of that of nineteen forty two. She had a good sense of, you know, hairstyles and dresses, but also interesting photos of uh, school activities and the uh, architecture, uh, some of the first scenes of U.S. military on the streets, for, you know, uh, of Vieques as well, it's kind of interesting. It's a really good treasure. So we got a lot of, you know, a lot of things donated in that way. Let me go to Dr. Corona and I'll come back. Dr. Corona? Yeah, I wanted to say that um, Isaac Dukin wrote uh, a fairly uh, article about the Danish claim on uh, Yekes. Mm -hmm. And he published it in um, uh, the Journal of Caribbean History or Research. Mm -hmm. I think it's a publication coming out of Puerto Rico. Good. The uh, Alegria's uh, uh, Research Institute. Mm -hmm. And uh, if I recall correctly, um, there were about two attempts to colonize Vieques uh, by the Danes, and they get wiped out. And um, when uh, the Danes decided that they really wanted to buy uh, St. Croix from the French, they tried to exchange <laughs> Crab Island for St. Croix, hoping that 
Louis XIV would know better. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, they discovered that this was a hoax, really, that the Danes were trying to get something for nothing, because they certainly didn't have any possession of Crab right. uh, right. Island at the time. The other thing I wanted to say is uh, I think uh, the original Indian name of Yekes is Yek, mm -hmm. which was recorded by the French as B I E Q U E, mm -hmm. a B instead of a V. Yes. And uh, uh, yeah, my question, the question I had is, you said that there were some uh, English-speaking uh, workers that uh, were brought into. Yeah, I guess in the 19th century, I believe. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm certain they were not Catholics. No, this was. This so what? How was the exception made, and when did Protestant churches get established on Yekes? Yekes is allowed. Right. Um, Vieques was uh, part of the Spanish Catholic colony, right? The, right. the Spanish Catholic government. And uh, uh, Vieques and Ponce, one of the major cities of Puerto Rico, were the first two towns under Spanish Catholic regime uh, where a non-Catholic congregation was allowed to be formed. This is in 1872, and specifically to provide the spiritual services for these large numbers of free black Protestant workers both in Vieques and in Ponce. So we had the, it was an Anglican church uh, that opened, uh, no, a, a, yeah, Anglican church that opened in Vieques uh, in, I want to say, 1872. The Methodists came a little bit later at the beginning of the 20th century as part of the U.S. occupation and then the U.S. churches influence in, in, uh, in Puerto Rico. But it was, without a doubt, uh, because of this, th this large number of people from St. Thomas, St. Croix, St. Kitts, Neves, Tortola, Virgen Gorda, who come into Vieques have a profound impact on Vieques development. Culturally, not just in religion, but there were schools for English language kids in Vieques. Um, and these workers also were part, you know, had a tradition as well of defending their dignity. So they also participated in several uprisings on plantations, 1864 in the plantation known as Resolución, and in 1874 another large <coughs> uprising of these Tortoleño workers. Many of them ended up jailed at the fort. And this created also a diplomatic issue because they were British subjects. They actually worked in Vieques under a special regulation promulgated by the Spanish government in Puerto Rico, a special regulation for foreign peons. But when they were arrested in this uprising in 1874, British diplomats had to come in and, and deal with the Spanish government to, to finally get their release and send them back to wherever they wanted to go. Some went back to Vieques, actually. Yeah, what about the Antiguans and, and Barbadians? I uh, don't, not very much from Antigua and very little. I mean, there are one or two mentions of Antigua and Barbados and Trinidad, but it's mostly, again, St. Thomas, St. Croix, St. Kitts, Neves, Tortola, Virgen Gorda are the key areas. Anigada, maybe? One or two. Okay. Questions? Susan? Um, very quickly, is, what can we do to help you? Uh, what kinds of materials are you interested in discovering out of uh, the Virgin Islands, whether it's St. Croix or St. Thomas or St. John? Uh, obviously, the, the, these documents that you guys have mentioned that are online, I'm sure are going to be really helpful to us. So we'll do everything we can to make sure we can see them online and then let you know what we couldn't see or what we might need and how to get it. Uh, any other documents that people might have related to migration or movement or ships movement uh, between the islands. We certainly want any of that, so send it all. Um, I mean, it's also important for us, I am totally St. Thomas ignorant. I'm, you know, I, I was really 
so impressed by the trip this morning to see the grandiose <coughs> nature of the historic architecture that's still there. So people in St. Thomas should be, I'm sure you are, very proud of the fact, whether it's, you know, I mean, a lot of the buildings, because it's, it takes a lot of money to maintain and restore, in a poor community, even in a rich community, it takes a lot of money. Yeah. And if you don't have it, I mean, the, but the fact that the buildings are still there and that there are people working to make sure they continue to be in the hands of the community, fighting against what I can imagine are enormous economic pressures that would love to take these wonderful, beautiful, historic buildings that belong to slave families or free black families who made en enormous efforts to build their own communities. And I yeah, know there are people who would love to turn those into bed and breakfast or turn them into whatever. That for uh, us in Vieques, dealing with some of that, those issues of, you know, is a really horrific uh, idea. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, I, again, St. Thomas, history of St. Thomas. I mean, if uh, I, I, it'd be neat to get a good bibliography on St. Thomas, and maybe you can email us a bibliography. I mean, I could probably just Google that, but if you've got one, already done a bibliography if there are any you know like general textbooks to have one or two textbooks on St. Thomas history would be neat so you want anybody that wants to donate some whatever you've got a you know one or two textbooks that describe St. Thomas history that would be neat as well I think there's also a great opportunity for partnerships between us <coughs> mm -hmm. uh, for preserving our documentary heritage um, is it Anise here? Did she come in? Oh, no. She came. She was in the back. Okay. So Anise uh, Canton, one of the. Um, is she still on the board? No. no. Okay. Former board member uh, and myself and others attended a meeting just this week at the University of the Virgin Islands about working with the Digital Library of the Caribbean to get these materials up online and they will Excellent. host them for us. We were talking about the possibility of them hosting oral histories as well as audiovisual right. material. So this is something that we should be Great. taking advantage, yeah. of, advantage of with you as well. Yes. Um, and I know that Puerto Rico is working now with the Digital Library of the Caribbean on a national historic mm -hmm. uh, newspaper digitization program mm -hmm. through NEH, uh, something that we would like to be participating with them as well. So um, there, there are so many ways that we could collaborate. Great. I think. That That's, great. you know, maybe some type of a at least email communication about to begin to look at possibilities, maybe a Skype conference at some point to talk about possible collaborations. Um, that'd be wonderful. Any? Yes. Grab me if you don't know Susan. She's one of our founders. And she's also the author. Very old. And also the author of The Passenger List Finding Aid. So that's, I think, one of the documents you mentioned right. that you'd be interested in. Good. That we'll share you that link. Mm -hmm. If you have any questions about that, she probably knows those documents more than anybody at this point. But my question to you was, uh, in your archives, what is the gem, the thing you know is in your archives that nobody else knows about that you think would be most interesting <laughs> for more people to know about? <laughs> Uh, it, we have a whole bunch of gems, it's like a kind of little gold mine or a gem mine, you know, it's a lot of really neat stuff. Among other things, you know, this, this photo collection of the 1942 is a really very, very important historic document of that period, a crucial period. It's the changing moment of Vieques from a, a sugar industry to this militarized space. So that's, that's one. Um, we also have a large collection of recordings, thousands of hours of oral history recordings. Some of them done by this project in the, in the 80s in St. Croix. We've got several of those. A few digitized, but not, not many. So we have a lot of these you know, cassettes that, that we try to keep in air conditioned space and humidity control, but we need to get those digitized. But that's also a really big treasure. Um, we... Um, this really neat document, uh, the original inventory of the Playa Grande sugar mill. It's from 1941. It was done, uh, the Navy hired, uh, hired a guy, an engineer, to do this inventory because the Navy was going to expropriate the sugar plantation, did expropriate, it was almost the entire western end of Vieques. And, and for me it's really great because it's got this it's a very detailed inventory of, all, of the lands, the machinery, the trucks, 
the buildings, the structures of all types, some of the tools, the number of tracks. There were train tracks because there were railroads moving things around the Vieques for the, particularly on the western end, this Playa Grande mill had trains, the Esperanza mill on the south coast that belonged to the Murray and Martino, the French families, had another train system. There are still locomotives in situ in, in Esperanza, not in good repair, but they are there. In any event, this inventory has also very good lists of the, the, the plantation or the sugar central properties were divided uh, into sectors, areas known as colonias, colonies. And one of them, the Campania colony on the north east coast, for all of them there were lists of, of ho horses, mares, mules, uh, cows, and bulls, uh, oxen. Oxen, right? A lot of oxen for these sugar stuff. I mean, you guys, I'm sure, have seen a lot of photos of oxen here as well, right? To pull those sugar carts. Well, the very long lists and very detailed for the oxen in this particular uh, field. You know, the, the a number, a name. Every oxen had a name, and every and it was described by its color, and then any particular mark. So, oxen number 54 of the Campania colony of the Playa Grande sugar mill. Uh, its color was bright yellow or yellowish bright color and the name was Rabin, R-A-B-I-N. <laughs> so for me that's like the jewel of the... <laughs> sure, there's, sure there's other more important stuff. <laughs> but, um, but there's some really good recordings. We've got some really neat recordings, some in video as well. This, with this woman, Apol Apollonia Gittings, whose family is from St. Kitts Nevis. She was the English teacher for decades in Vieques, right, throughout a, a good part of the 20th century. And we have a great recording of her. I mean, some say that she's so old, she taught the Puerto Ferro man, which was 4,000 years ago, probably. But it's a great, we have a great video of her and a couple of others, of a really important um, musician from Vieques, Joaquin Santos, who died many years ago. And he was part of some of Puerto Rico's well-known music groups of the 40s and 50s. Um, and so we got a great video of him talking about his work and singing some of his songs. So there's some really good stuff on film that needs to be preserved. I mean, this is really important to have digitized. I think we have those two digitized, but there are a lot of others that are also important. Uh, I want to also mention that um, Gerald Singer is here today, and Gerald, who lives in St. John, is wrote a, a really important book, did a really important book. It's a photo, photo book, but it's much more than that. It's a history of, of Vieques. You know, it's, a, it's a photo book that a lot of tourists who come to Vieques, they see it and they want it because it's the great photos that most people would love to be able to take because he's a really good photographer. But he came to Vieques and spent many, many, many hours and days and weeks in Vieques over the course of years talking to people about the history of the island. So it's, a not, it's not a tourist book. It really is a good, gives you a good sense of Vieques and people's struggles and important places of Vieques. So just wanted you to know who's here. Gerald. And it's a beautiful book. It's called Vieques. Probably get it online. Gerald Singer. Dr. Reem, I uh, wanted to ask you, like, can you just rent a car and just drive around the whole island these days now? Or, uh... You can't really still access. The Navy took 26,000 acres of Vieques. Right. How much time do I have to talk about right. the Navy? Right. Huh? We're close. We're close, all right. So the Navy took 26,000 right. acres, and they continue, the U.S. federal government continues to control almost all of that, and most of it is still off limits. The eastern end, there are still thousands of unexploded bombs in the mangrove lagoons and the beaches and the waters around the eastern end of Vieques. So this, so the, uh, after this intense struggle, I'm sure many of you know about this really powerful, wonderful struggle. The people of Vieques, this small island, armed with nothing more than love for their place and with an immense amount of solidarity from people throughout the world, particularly the rest of the Puerto Rican nation in the archipelago and in the, and, and in the diaspora without firing a single shot, defeated the most powerful military force in the history of humanity, the U.S. Navy. And this was by no means an anti-American, not even an anti-Navy movement. This was a movement to stop a horrific thing that uh, the U.S. Navy was doing on the island of Vieques. And people made enormous sacrifices, risked their lives. Now, 
Uh, on my third arrest, I was finally, you know, I spent six months in the federal prison in San Juan. But priests and nuns and pastors and university students, Vietnam veterans, Korean War veterans, Viequenses and others were arrested in the bombing range when we would go in and, and just before they were about to begin bombing from ships or jets, shoot up a flare or wave a flag, make yourself known so they would come down and arrest you. People would go out at 2, 3 in the morning. Very, anyway, mm -hmm. this struggle has a you know, big success. 1 May 2003, the Navy stops bombing. Right? And by virtue of federal you know, congressional um, military authorization act for, for 2003, orders the U.S. Navy stop bombing May 1st, 2003, and jurisdiction of the lands the Navy controlled is now given to the Interior Department and their Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, so Fish and Wildlife is now in charge of preserving Navy contamination, kind of. Oh. Right. So, right. They, have, they have described the Fish and Wildlife Service has designated the live impact area where the Navy dropped over a uh, according to James Porter from the University of Georgia, around a trillion pounds of explosives over half a century, including lots of napalm, every conventional weapon in the arsenal from the Second World War until 2003. The Navy admitted to the use of radioactive depleted uranium weapons on Vieques. The, Na the, the Fish and Wildlife people designated it, that intensely bombed area a wilderness zone which by definition is a pristine area untouched by man. <laughs> to keep people out, obviously. And the rest of it is a re wildlife refuge. Some of the beaches have been opened up and people can go into some of the area, but most of it is not. So you can't drive around the whole island. But you certainly can see all of Vieja. You, know, you need a couple of days, a few days. It's not something you can walk. I know I moved here in 82, and I didn't know where the heck I was because they were doing a maneuver like in March when they used to come down. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I thought I was in Nicaragua, uh, yeah. Panama, or something. Well, they left like, from Vieques many times to go, specifically to Nicaragua or to right. Panama. The, mm -hmm. you know, Vieques was intensely used for uh, the invasion, of the, the the failed Bay of Pigs invasion in '61 in Cuba. The invasion of the Dominican Republic. We sent 17,000 U.S. Marines to make sure a U.S. a pro-U.S. president got elected in the Dominican Republic, and part of that training was done in Vieques throughout all of Vietnam. Vieques was intensely used. There were a lot of, you know, military... Well, what I was trying to say is that the buildings were shaking yeah, here, and things it was shook. just, like, really weird. The dogs yeah. would go nuts and stuff. Yeah. Things, things shook in Vieques as well. Cable TV is much better now. What's that? Cable TV is much better. It used to get interfered with when they were in yeah. the you said something about your radio. Radio Vieques, you can hear it on the internet. The signal comes out of Culebra. We have our antenna in Culebra. The studio is at the fort, the museum. Uh, it's a community radio project that we created. The Committee for the Rescue and Development of Vieques, which is the grassroots, this is my other half now, right? But the commu Committee for the Rescue and Development of Vieques, which is the principal grassroots community organization working on the struggle to stop the bombing. And when in the post bombing phase, we're now dealing with the decontamination process, the issue of the lands, and these issues of gentrification. And, and within all of this, obviously, historic investigation and sense of identity are crucial. But we, um, we're using radio as part of a, you know education community project in a weekly way with different stations. And we decided there were, an opportunity was open, a window opened to the FCC. We applied. We got this thing. So we just got on the air in September. It's 90.1 FM, but RadioVieques.net, and you can listen. It's incredibly wonderful music almost all the time, and we have a developing project of programming. Monday through Friday, we have a talk show from 7 to 9. Kids from the high school, just, you know, sports, club, the judo club, baseball club, um, uh, women's health issues, environmental issues. Also, it's a community and regional project, so Culebra has a half hour every day with us a segment and we work close with Culebra and some of the towns on the mainland of Puerto Rico close by as well. It's it's mostly in Spanish. There are some bilingual segments, one about animal rights, etc. Okay. okay, we have one last question and then Mr. Ravine has to go back to Puerto Rico today. Mm -hmm. So, I was in Vegas a few years ago and saw the development that was going on and I got the sense of this people coming from the U.S. mainland Developing Vegas, is that still true? Yes, th this is again, these are, uh, you know, these, I'm not sure, you know, exactly what you're referring to, what you saw. My guess is you're talking about the strip in Esperanza where there are all the hotels yeah. 
and there, you know, if there are 20 hotels and restaurants of business, 19 of them belong to people who look like me and not like the people of Vieques. And this is the issue of gentrification. It's a touchy issue, it's a difficult issue, but it's a life and death issue for any community. If we don't speak about this in an open and frank way, you know, no, the, the idea is not to say that nobody from, no Americans or Germans or Russians or people from the moon can come and, and invest in, in any place, right? That's not the issue. But when people, when the 90% of the economy of a place is controlled by others, there is something fundamentally incorrect that is an ingredient for tension, for resentment, for conflict. So why not talk about it in a good way and look to create mechanisms to revert, if it's possible, some of that process and make sure that future economic development takes place in a more correct way? The, the, the short answer is yes. Uh, the short answer is yes. It's a, it's a continuing process, and again, it's what we uh, refer to as gentrification. Okay, I would like to say that there's one CD left, because everything else has been sold. Could we have it for the St. John Historical Society, please? <laughs> What's that? This is mm, sure. Mr. David Knight. From Hello, the Mr. Saint David John, Knight. From the St. John Historic Society. Hello, Adam. We keep right. an archive and we'd love to have one in our show. It's yours. It's usually $190, but today how much? <laughs> <laughs> I would like to sincerely thank Mr. Robert Levine. I have learned so much today, and I think I can start looking at Vieques for the disappearance of one or two of my ancestors, and I hope that you also enjoyed this chat today and that you learned something new, right? Yes. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you.